I'll just r read the three points in brief so that everybody is familiar with what they are exactly. So the, the middle class is integrated according to three points. They all participate in economic hierarchy. The life chances of individuals are shaped by their connection to capitalist hierarchy, right? Of course, as is everybody's in capitalism, but uh, of course, the middle class being in the middle is more acutely nervous about their position. Number two, we have consumption patterns. Their relatively high incomes underwrite distinctive, comfortable standards of living. This forges a sense of common position and underwrites intermarriage and other forms of demographic class formation. Yeah, the, the middle class, we are obsessed with lifestyle, fashion, art, all of these kinds of things, like consumption activities. Th this uh, is extremely, extremely important to our social interactions yeah. in a way that uh, working class people can't afford to engage in. And in a way that the haute bourgeoisie, they engage in it, but they don't like they don't really need to worry about it as much. Yeah. It's not as much of an obsession for them. It's more of a just kind of a thing you do. It's it's um, why I made the connection to Bourdieu and Habitus. It seems like it strongly yeah. connects to con like that that idea of consumption patterns being yeah. a class uniter, right? Like. Like basically, like like look at what in in North America. Look at like West Coast EDM festival culture. Yeah, right. As a right. huge like like they, it's like no, they're all middle and upper class people or, whose capacity to spend a shit ton of money and not work for a week or not work for like a month every summer defines their membership of, of a common group. And if you're not yeah. a member of that group, it's they don't you don't get treated super well. Or or like you know you can go back in time to like. I mean, this is to some degree a thing even now, but like the obsession among the middle class in older times with having your kids learn to play piano and play piano for other middle class people when they come over, that that that's a kind of consumption pattern of this type. Yeah. You play violin, um, but not the fiddle. It, yeah, it that's right. That's right. If you ask me, it's like it's a large reason for why a lot of art and like high end classical music and jazz becomes abstract and atonal yeah. is because you know we're, now that working class people can access Beethoven and Bach and these ones that are easy to to on your ear like we got to be able to differentiate ourselves by liking this other thing that you know that now that everybody else can access not just the lords and the the rich bourgeoisie yeah, yeah. I mean, there's the the interclass differentiation, but there's also the intraclass distinction, which is you know the thing that Bourdieu focuses on in that book is you you, know, you have to you have to distinguish yourself from other middle class people by making these uh, aesthetic gestures and accomplishments that are uh, you know daring, innovative, and highly technical. Because uh, that's really what you got to go on for, in terms of your life chances. Because, you know, intermarriage and property is so important. Is that, uh, is that what then, this podcast is? Is that, what, the, is that our, what our podcasts are? I don't know. Maybe. That's, that's <laughs> well, the thing that happens whenever Bourdieu, whenever anybody, any podcaster reads Bourdieu, they have a very uncomfortable moment of self-realization. Because it's like I'm looking at myself through this lens, and it, it hurts. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I hope digitally we are doing something useful, but but <laughs> certainly I I don't think I would be doing this podcast if I weren't part of this like middle class that is defined here. Yeah, the usefulness uh, is, is 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 secondary. Let's be honest here. <laughs> no, <don't. laughs> Oh yeah, you know, because like I get I get so much clout for being on this podcast, Tom. You have no idea. Oh, it's like I, I go down to I go down to like the uh, I go down to the brew pub, and I'm like, yo, I was just on from Alpha to Omega yesterday. It's kind of a big deal. We were talking about Michael Mann's theory of class um, and Wright's critique of it. it. Was it was it was pretty heavy. Uh, I must say, I, I've never met anybody in the real world who ever said, oh, I listen to your podcast. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. oh, Tom, and you've been at this so long, too. 
<laughs> the sign of a true failure. Uh, oh, keep going, dear. Kyle. Keep going. All right, all right. The final one here is capital investments. So these three, the three fractions of the middle class can convert income into small investment capital, definitely underlining the small part. So we're talking here about, I guess, like in contemporary times, this would be like property ownership, owning a house or maybe two. Or if you are actually PB, you might even have uh, like fairly significant by middle class standards, small capital, uh, small capital investments, right? Like, you know, when we're talking about the petty, petty bourgeoisie, these are typically people these days who would be like millionaires, multimillionaires. They, they, they do have uh, f- what, what to them and to people beneath them in the class hierarchy would seem to be fairly significant capital investments. But to people in the actual haute bourgeoisie look like, you know, a rounding error of a rounding error. Right. A lot of these people, I think, are people with, you know, uh, rental properties and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Like slum, rental landlords, landlords of any type uh, definitely fall under that capital investment category. You could be like, uh, you know, you could if you're if you're petty bourgeoisie, you might even own like two businesses that have some capital investments and you might have a you know, fi- fairly substantial stock portfolio or ownership in some kind of uh, like resort development property. Like the, these are these are things that are all very out of the reach of somebody who is working class or probably also professional or a careerist. But nevertheless, they are they are small in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting observation, Kyle. Because I remember you know, going back and reading, like, kind of like the the kind of ideal, you know, stuff about the ideologues of like the neoliberal shift, and like when all the think tanks and the Chicago boys and stuff were trying to like get, we're trying to popularize the idea of like profit sharing and like stock options for like workers and companies. And mm-hmm. their argument was, I think it was the argument was precisely that they hoped it would do for the working class what it did for the middle class, right? Which is like give people a feeling that they had ownership in the system, even though the diffusion and deregulation of finance, as like guys like David Harvey pointed out, like like since the 70s has actually been associated with like a massive concentration of wealth and ownership of the means of production. It, it gives you a sense. And like for the middle class, I think that is, it's a huge thing. Yeah. You're like, you're the slumlord, but you're, you invest, you're, you're investing in this or that. And it's the same comp, you know, like you start, you start having a kind of uh, a material financial incentive for the growth imperative. Of, uh, it, of those especially companies. in today's politics, it's about whether or not you are a homeowner. And that is going to have a, a very decisive effect on your politics because home ownership has be through, through like state action has been turned into like, it's commodified again. You know, this, this sort of exhaustive capital investment for the non-PB sections of the middle class. Yeah. All, all of the like employee share schemes is like that. I worked for Ericsson and you had this like you would get a certain number of shares every year. And if you wanted as a bonus and if you wanted, you could like put your own money into it. And everybody was I worked there in the dot com boom and everybody was like, yeah, you should just load up and buy the maximum amount of shares. So I did. You know, I put like two or three grand from my when I started working. It was quite a lot for me into it. And the shares, the, the bubble burst in the dot com era. And the shares went from being worth 200 SEK, 230 SEK, I think, to 2.5 SEK. And we lost 99% of our value. And that's <laughs> why the middle class is so plagued with anxiety. Yeah. I, I still own the shares technically that they're somewhere, but they've worth so little now. Like they went from being worth like, you know, five grand worth of shares to being worth like 50 quid. And I've, I haven't followed them since. I don't know what they're worth. Maybe they're worth a hundred quid now or something. I think you can, you can tell that I'm like just such a dork because for some reason I'm just making all these connections in my mind to those like new NFT scheme video games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, like play to earn, right? You know, and then you'll just be like, Right. It's just like, yeah, it was like, oh, our gamer is a class, like just like a really shitty class. <laughs> gamers like, our gamer is a class. Yeah. <laughs> the gamitariat is is being exploited. 
The game um, of theories that you exploit, yeah, it's just like, like, oh yeah, it's just like, just keep fucking grinding it out, right? And then you're gonna get like the the Ubisoft uh, Ghost Recon pants, and you can sell them on the go uh, the Ubisoft controlled NFT market or whatever, right? And then like, and then the NFT market collapses, and they're like, oh my god, you mean I was playing all these games just for fun? Like, I, I can't. <laughs> I, I, guys, I think I might be rich because I think it's gone back up to like 70, 20 years later. So I might have like a few grand sitting somewhere. Oh, Tom, you should, Tom, you might want to sell those stocks before the next crash. Look, you, you, mean, you, mean, you mean before four weeks ago? Yeah. No, I, I mean the next one that will be even deeper. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's September. Great. It's coming September. It's always coming. Uh, yeah, pro probably, probably. I mean, don't never ask a Marxist for financial advice, but uh, yeah. But th this is the first time like – like with COVID, we had a bit of a crash too. When we expected that when that happened, but like this is the first time since 2008 where like fucking people are really going. All right, we are. It's coming. And I like. I feel like everybody's just going. It's coming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like. But you it, too lurk on Wall Street bets. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's it's like how uh, you know Marx talks about how like there were there were financial crises prior to the tulip bubble that were caused by like a bad harvest or war or something like that or disease. But then you have the endogenous capitalist crises uh, that, that come out of the speculative realm. And that's what we're going to see, not the one that's caused by uh, COVID. Exogenous versus endogenous motherfuckers. Yes. I hear you. Okay. Well, there's Let's also exogenous on. factors like war and, and, and disease and stuff. Yeah, but I don't think war is exogenous. I think it's endogenous. Well, yeah, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. We're on to multiple levels of class analysis. Right. central criticism of man's announced strategy of class analysis is his dismissal of the relevance of studying what he calls quote-unquote latent classes. Ray thinks that a deeper understanding of these historical processes is advanced by trying to systematically bring together the three conceptual clusters of class analysis, classes as social structure, classes as social groups, and classes as organized social actors. Mann's objections to the study of latent classes comes, at least in part, from his rejection of the classical class in itself slash class for itself conceptualization of class. In that understanding, there is a one-to-one -one mapping of classes formed as collective actors and the categories within objectively defined class structures, combined with a teleological theory of the process by which the structurally defined classes are transformed into classes as collective actors, correctly in Eric and Wright's view. To reject man's programmatic position does not mean reverting to the teleology of class in itself slash class for itself. One can believe that class relations and class structures are real and generate real effects without also believing in any one-to-one -one mapping between the complex structure of class relations and the formation of collective actors. So it's like you get the kind of like... Uh, I don't know, the, the sort of like left post-Marxist position of uh, like, we don't agree with Mouffe and Laclau, but that, that economic dimension is, is irrelevant. But uh, we also don't believe that there is a necessary one-to-one -one mapping between the economic latent class, the class in itself, and what emerges as the class for itself. And, and how that class understands itself and its objectives yeah. and its position, yeah. right? Like, it's like, yeah, it's like the difference between saying, as I said before, it's the difference between saying that there is no necessary connection between in itself and for itself and to say that there's necessarily no connection, right? Where it's like, it's all just magical discourse. At the same time, like, I mean, people like LeClau and Mouffe, the reason why they were able to make careers of that shit was because it, they were able to, you know, argue, you know, that there was, you know, too much simplistic a determinist linkage between in itself and for itself. And, and, then, and then, you know, and, and then use that to make an analysis that ultimately is not very convincing. But what I'm wondering is, here's a question for you two. It may be that I'm just not brushed up enough on my old school red theory, but 
does the terminology class in and in itself and class for itself need to be understood teleologically? Like in my mind, it feels like it has some analytical value, right? Like I, that, I, that we're kind of discussing in this. In I this. think that the problem is that kind of like the inheritance of the Hegelian framework in, in, in that is implied in class in itself, class for itself, like that you're kind of treating them as whole concepts and it, 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 the, the logic follows that the class in itself would become a class for itself that is like wholly self-conscious. It would, it would go from being, you know, like latent to being conscious. And I don't think that like, I don't think it's necessary to follow that line of reasoning, but it's, it's basically, I would say it's like, it's suggested by the framework, even if it's not a necessary conclusion. Right. Okay. And like, from my understanding of it, like, and forgive me if I have this wrong, but I don't think Marx is like a hard teleological, like no, the difficulty like of, it, of, it, of it coming and the structure of the thing will lead to a certain types of behaviors, like, and whether like the working class wins or not, say they get defeated, but the same structural things occur to cause those kind of oppositional forces to rise again, you know. And I, I, I feel like for Marx, it's kind of. Like whether I am reading this into Marx my way or whether I have this correct or I'm not sure, but it's like it's like that there is a kind of a system logic whereby these things occur again and again, and you know perhaps for Marx he think, he, he feels like there's inevitability it will it will dominate at one stage. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, well, it's it's the difficulty of like the final section of Capital Volume One treats these things in extremely totalizing terms because like it's it's basically like okay well what if we do like a two class system analysis and right. what comes out of that right yeah and then you get the what is it the second to last chapter of capital volume one which is extremely apocalyptic and is talking about like you know the integument being burst and a new world being born and all this kind of stuff. Right. And all of that, it, like that section of capital volume one is very teleological and, and totalizing. But then of course you get stuff like the 18th Brumaire or even like other sections of capital volume one that are more like ethnographic or sociological that don't really suggest that. So I, I think it's like, it's, you could certainly read that teleological reading out of what Marx wrote, but it's not a necessary thing that you would have to conclude, or even what I think Marx actually believed most of the time, even if sometimes he did believe in the like 100% teleological apocalyptic, the working class is going to go kick the capitalist class's ass and get communism and it's going to be like an everybody's on board kind of effort. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, I was just going to say exactly the same thing. Like, you know, in, in capital, he sets up like, you know, the capitalist and the workers, blah, blah, blah. But when you look at the, the Brumaire, you know that way where he does a class analysis in the Brumaire, Kyle? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, it's micro class analysis. So like, yeah. it's like he's looking at different abstracted layers of the analysis and saying yeah. things. And then, you know, like, that's the way I, I, I view it. Like, that for me, is like you have these system logic, you have these tendencies in the system that throw up battles. And, you know, like, to me, it seems like that if, if the dynamics are reoccurring and if they keep reoccurring, in some sense, as a kind of system logic, you would expect uh, the working class to win at some stage. And I, I kind of look at, the Marx's ideas in that kind of a sense, as opposed to the working class will just rise up and beat them. Yay. First time off or whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think you're, you're completely right that, that there is this tendency from the class in itself to the class for itself that you see again and again and again, and is, is really the most valid part of that whole framework right. you don't you don't need to think in terms of the, the the teleology well it's it's a it's a weak teleology right it's uh right. it's uh what do you call that a tendency yeah it is it is a tendency but i was thinking in like aristotelian terms like mm. it's not the it's not governed by the final cause it's governed by like 
there's another cause in the four cause structure that's like the one that we're talking about. Yeah, was it? I'm going to say one thing else, but I would say that the teleological view that's been put forward here would be the dominant view, I would say, in the academy, Western academy, of what Marx meant. Yeah, probably. And, 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 and in, in popular culture, too, I would right. say. Right, yeah, overwhelmingly. It's because, like, that is, like, the view that, the like, Manifesto uh, like Len Leninist right. parties promoted for yeah. most of the 20th century, so, yeah. And like, that no, was I'm not convenient for, for bourgeois ideology, too, because they could look at the, mo the least kind of nuanced take of kind yeah. of hardcore Leninist organized. And then, and then, and then, and then the, the kind of straw man uh, rejection of that just basically becomes like grade 10 social studies curriculum in North America. Right. Yeah. Uh, right? Hey, well, the middle, uh, the middle class exists, you know, like, so we don't have to think about any of this stuff. Yeah, we don't anymore. have to worry about it because middle class, everybody's middle class. Blah, Capitalism blah, blah. naturally produces a middle class and the middle class is somehow the ruling class. Like the other thing I would say as well is the Communist Manifesto is pretty much it can be read teleologically, and it's like the dominant short text anyone would read. Right. Yeah, that's true. In stages of history, right? Like, far ahead of this one, then. Adam Przewalski states the problem well. Positions within social relations constitute limits upon the success of political practice. But within these historically concrete limits, the formation of classes in struggle is determined by struggles that have class formation as their effect. So, yes, the creation, the creation of the working class was what allowed the yes. working class to act as a class in itself, for itself. Yes, there is like there is a struggle that gives birth to the formation of a class in struggle, like hyphenized class for itself kind of thing, right? Right. And, 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 and couldn't even conceptualize the class, like that class struggle yes. without there being some relation to those actors as individuals and, and collectives within certain determined relations of production. Yeah, right? yeah, and yeah. Relations, uh, uh, both within and between classes. Otherwise, what are they struggling about? Exactly. If this claim is correct, if the structure of class relations imposes limits on possible formations of collective class actors, it is worthwhile to try to understand the general properties of these sets of class relations or class structures that generate these limits. I mean, I think this is extremely obvious. We should probably just move on to the next slide. Wright's work on contradictory class locations is one strategy of doing this. He has argued that individuals are located in complex ways within social relations of production. So this is complexity in the way jobs are located within the social relations of production. In particular, jobs are relationally defined with respect to both capitalist property relations and authority relations. We also have complexity in the way market relations are linked to employment relations. This is especially relevant for the problem of skills and expertise. And then we have complexity in the temporal aspects of class locations. Uh, this corresponds closely to Mann's discussion of careers positions and Goldthorpe's notion of the service class. You can also throw in there like people who are petty bourgeois or bourgeois, but had like three years of their life where they were living, uh, you know, in a kind of working class situation because they weren't getting much money from their parents, right? Like they were, they were, they were doing a service job or something like this. And then, and then boom, uh, you know, their inheritance kicks in and then, you know, they, they, they resume their, their normal class position. It, it also sort of explains the weird shift, like ideological shift of like, you know, like the, the miseration and precarity created by neoliberalism means that there, there are, you know, large sections of young people like who raised, were raised in working uh, middle class families who rapidly saw their, their relational position within relations of production shift very rapidly relative to their parents. And they, they have like, like so much of the debates around like the new, you know, like, you know, the managerial class, all this sort of stuff, all these debates around, you know, kind of cultural politics of the left. Like I, I always see a lot of it is like, yeah, there's like a lot of people who were raised with middle class habitus who are now in a, in a working class position. <laughs> like, cause, and, and they're very angry because their parents and their teachers did not tell them that their life was going to be this way. 
right? Yeah, like their their parents were able to own property, yeah. but they won't be able they to. They won't be able to, right? Yeah. Their employment prospects, even within the same industries, and, ha- and, and, and their job security is different relative to their parents who may be professionals or whatever, right? Like, yeah, for sure, for sure. So now we also have complexity in the way individuals are linked to class relations through family and kinship. Uh, so this is especially salient in households in which both husband and wife are in the labor force. I mean, it's also very salient in families from cultures where like you have really strong relationships with your like extra atomic family unit family groupings, right? Like, you know, uh, like Chinese families uh, where it's like, you know, you're all kind of engaged in each other's business and, and working towards an economic goal together. And then uh, we also have complexity generated by the way people within what I term or what right terms privileged locations within the process of exploitation are able to capitalize their surplus income in the form of capital investments. So if you are a coder, you know, there's a lot of demand in the labor market for coding work uh, relative to other forms of uh, work, then you might be able to use that temporary difference in purchasing power to make capital investments, uh, just like Tom was talking about with uh, the Ericsson investments uh, that uh, he has. <laughs> you, could, you could look at you could look at uh, outside of tech, like in North America too. I would argue that the labor aristocracy of the oil and gas industry is like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They're, not, they're, they're raised with working class habitus. Uh, they d- often don't have higher education, although obviously, like the engineer professionals are the ones that do the best. But like like uh, sectoral booms allow them to reap. A massive incomes, even while capital has structured, uh, fossil capital has structured the regime of of the energy industry to essentially give these people almost like a, a tiny pittance of resource rents in terms of wages. But the reality of high energy prices is that wages are so high that they all invest in stocks, they all invest in their houses, they own their own homes, and their kind of class position or at least their cla- their understanding of themselves as a class kind of shifts in a, in a way they become yeah they're, they're life, of the right life circumstances shift if not yeah. their actual class, class position. position yeah 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 yeah, yeah. like during the boom in dublin like uh, you bricklayers were making so much money like bricklayers were yeah. making like one euro a brick and they were like like literally doing like a hundred bricks an hour and they were like or so they were like raking home like 800 euros, a thousand euros a day, you know, for wow. like a two or three year period. Yeah. They just made insane money, you know? And like, yeah. these guys are like driving like, you know, BMW 8 Series, <laughs> brickies, <laughs> you know, crazy <laughs> stuff. But I think what's so interesting here is that like all of these things we're talking about, the bricklayers, the energy workers, the, the, the kind of privileged coders, it's like, if there was not a, if there was, if there was not some connection between their life circumstances and their class position within product, productive really relationships, uh, there'd be nothing to analyze. <laughs> there'd be nothing yeah. to even, there'd be nothing to even attempt to explain and politics essentially, even political strategizing as socialist becomes almost impossible, right? Like how would right. you even do it? Yeah, you just you just chase whatever the issue of the day is on a well, that's purely, where we are now. Uh, op- purely opportunistic basis. Yeah, yeah, that's why I base my entire political strategy around monkey JPEGs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right clicking them, of course, not you know, right clicking multiple <laughs> monkey pictures. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> right, Kyle, right, last 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 slide. Okay. Uh, So we have an individual's objective location within class relations is determined by the totality of these complexities. These locations are not classes. They are locations within complexly structured class relations. A class structure is defined by the set of such locations within some appropriate unit of analysis. A central goal of class is to understand the causal connections between the objectively defined properties of class relations on the one hand and class formation and organized class struggle on the other. I mean, yes, yes, (laughs) that that is true. That is a truth statement. Like, 
I feel like this chapter was like kind of interesting, but it was also it, 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 it it's like explaining class to like the world's most stupid and out of touch person. Like, like, like really having to belabor the point that should be obvious. How can man yeah. like say that, you know, destruct like the what did he say that it's of no interest? What was the term he used? Let's see. Such uh, a late uh, class. objective a objective class. Is yeah. No sociological or little sociological interest. And then he goes on and talks about that's what he actually that's how he frames his actual work then. Yeah, like, yeah. Like I mean, I think Wright does a good job of like setting up here's man's like bullshit general argument, and here is how his specific argument contradicts his general argument, right. uh, and therefore his uh, whole framework is bogus. And the only way it seems vaguely conv convincing is because he can refer to specific analyses that look plausible, but don't actually follow the general framework. I keep having the phrase in my mind, it's like, you know, where you say like your, your mouth is writing checks, your butt can't cash, you know, like, it's like <laughs> his, yeah. theory, his theory is writing checks that his analysis can't cash or, or vice versa, you know, like, vice versa, right? it's vice versa, yeah, yeah. His analysis is writing checks, his theory, like he set up, and I think I had this conversation with you before, Kyle, when I was, you know, reading that, LeCloud populism book that I find, you know, I find LeCloud very wrong headed, but also kind of interesting. I have some interesting ideas that he, but he doesn't understand the implications of his ideas. You know, it's like, mm. it's like in that book, he, he lays out this whole operation that's pretty plausible in terms of how populist and even socialist movements discuss their common interests and objectives as a discourse. But then, right. he, but he, but he, but he then acts as though the only thing that really matters is how people discuss their common interests and not any actual material underlying connection they might have relative to even, even the classes they oppose. And what's then interesting is the best section of that book, in my opinion, is when he goes through all of his historical analyses of the rise and ultimate and, ultimate and inevitable demise of various populist movements. But the only way he can explain them is not by how they talk with each other, but why, like what, what role did the, you know, the, the low ranking military officials and the peasants and the workers in like Peron's Argentina, like what were their economic interests relative to each other and capitalism yeah. and so on. And how did that allow them to describe their interests as members of, of the common people against the elites or so on? And then why did that fall apart? And he doesn't have any way of doing that other than some analysis of who these people are, how they make their money and how that relates to Argentinian capitalism. Um, and so it's, like, so it's like the analysis is actually really good in those sections. And there's elements of his discursive analysis that make sense, but it doesn't actually, but, it, but, but, but he cannot link his, his actual theoretical claims with the analysis he, all, he does, which in the end, I think is actually pretty good. This seems to me like this as well. It's like and man's analysis seems much more interesting than his theory, you know, because yeah. his theory cannot really get him to the place where he can coherently make his analysis. He has to just kind of, it's almost like he has to sublimate it. You know? <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. There's like a, you know, just a, uh, it, it, there's, there's definitely some sleight of hand being played in all of these kinds of academic works. And, and it's like one of those, those cons where like the con person is taken in by their own con like where they Ride, like riding the snake, not self aware about their the how bullshit their own framework is. <laughs> Why do they care? <laughs> you know. Well, I, I do believe uh, humans don't really like care to, don't to, know. to feel like they're hypocrites. That's one thing. Yeah. Like, unless you're a sociopath, so like so much ideology is like rational is self rationalization. Like you know, like yeah. it's, very, it's very hard to like think of yourself as, as someone who is completely hypocritical or, or not living by their professed beliefs or values. So it's like, I feel like you, sometimes you just have an incentive to pretend like what you're saying makes sense. And I think academia is, is just terrible for that. Right. Like <laughs> it's just, the, it's just the worst for it. Like people are constantly contradicting themselves. Right. They're, they put on that little hat when they write a paper and they're like, Oh, this makes sense. And then you talk one at the bar and you realize like, Oh, you don't actually live your life as though what you wrote makes any sense. You know, yes. It would be impossible. Like, the classic academic absurdity. 
Tom, you've put an image up on the screen here, which I believe is a 9-11 joke, but British? <laughs> yes. Too soon! <laughs> Too soon, Tom! <laughs> it's, only been, oh, Tom. <laughs> it's only been 21 years! It really made me laugh. <laughs> this is pretty uh, good. So for the listeners, this is a depiction of two big bends next to each other. <laughs> that and itself makes me laugh. There, there is there is a London City bus that has been crashed, like been flung into one of the big bends, and the other one is about to impact the second big bend. And it's just a quote underneath that says, Your Majesty, there's been a second bus. It's just... <laughs> Like it is kind of glorious, right? Yeah. I think it took, I feel like it took me a minute, like or at least ten seconds, to be like, wait a minute, I think there's only one Big Ben. Yeah, <laughs> that's the beauty of it. Yeah, no, and it's I'm, great. No, it really hit when I realized that that was, what was going on. Like, <laughs> what I really like is that like the bus that's already hit comes in at quite a sharp angle, and then the other one that's coming in like it's just driving along the road. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh god. Yes, well. We've put that chapter to rest. God damn it, these chapters you. better start getting better. Oh yeah. I I, I I'm optimistic that like there's gonna be some bangers. <laughs> but this one was not a banger, but it was like it was all right. It wasn't it like, like a starter. So, it's like a starter to our main course kind of a chapter. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I thought it for me, I found it a little like I found it generative in the sense that like I could see like, oh yeah, this is a good way of of laying out what doesn't really make sense about, about that type of thinking. I mean, I'm just not that familiar with Michael Mann, but I think at least, I mean, but you're right, Kyle, like it, it's something that's like, it's something that is, should be very obvious, but maybe reflects a moment in time in terms of like critical theory where things that were very obvious <laughs> were being kind of like kind of be ch like challenged you know um like, yeah and, and be like someone's got to step in and be like i don't know man like come on esri's hypothesis was that Wright was doing this critique not only as a way of destroying man intellectually and, and pointing out the problems of this structure of critique but also as a sort of uh, like subtweeting way of uh, uh, of of critiquing the Bordigists who believe that uh, you know the party is exhaustive of the class. So uh, you know it has that value in terms of like intra Marxist intra left debates as well of like if. If you have, like, you know, we were talking about, like, uh, Laclau and Mouf, or you could talk about Bordiga, but if you have these, like, left political formations that privilege the political to an absurd extent, this argument is a good one to throw at them. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, I think that's right. I bet, like, how big, though, if, if, if Esri's making that thing that this is, like, you know, uh, Wright making a point, subtweeting about, like, Bordigas, like, was Wright even, like, how how online was that Bordigas subculture? Like, was it, is Wright really responding to that stuff? It's possible. Like, I I think kind of around the time that this book was being written, there were, like, there was a bit of a Bordigas fad going on, if I remember correctly. And so, can, is that can not you just like an this, online this fad to me, like Bordigas? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, but like among left intellectuals, it wasn't. It was, certainly wasn't a general politics thing. It wasn't as as prevalent as like uh, Laclau and Mouf for sure. As our old um, professor Rick Runeau used to say, it's like if you push if you if you push the discursive element of Gramsci too far, like eventually Gramsci just becomes a liberal. <laughs>